Hi everyone, I have missed you. How are you guys? Today we are talking about newborn care, jaundice, circumcision care, umbilical cord care. Um, I'm so happy to have you guys joining me. Um, I'm Nurse Melissa. I am Melissa Gerson. I have six years of experience in the Boston area as a maternity nurse. So I am uh, quite adept. I've been giving this advice for years and years to many different um, parents. So I'm very excited to be sharing with you guys newborn care today. We're going to be talking, like I said, about umbilical cords, um, umbilical cord care, uh, circumcision care, jaundice, when to call the doctor, all that kind of stuff. So if you're just tuning in or even just joining us from home, um, after the broadcast, I would love for you guys to um, share with friends. If you know anyone who's pregnant, anyone who's thinking about having another baby, even um, even if their other ones maybe two or three, but they're thinking about it, um, it'd be great for them to join us so that they can be up and ready for newborn care when their little one arrives. So um, I'm looking forward to today. And like I said, happy to be back. It's been a few weeks since I've been uh, doing some Facebook Lives, so missed you guys. Um, so yeah, um, first and foremost, I want to talk about umbilical cord care. So I'm sure you guys all have seen with the newborn babies when they're born, they have these little, these umbilical cords. What those are is they are actually to help baby to get all the nutrients that they need. So you probably don't know, but baby, baby's blood and mom's blood never mix. Babies don't breathe obviously in the womb because they're suspended in amniotic fluid. There's no air in the womb. So they actually need to get all their oxygen and all their nutrients, all their food um, through their mother and that comes through the blood source and that's the placenta. So everything is coming from mom. The placenta is a great filter. Mom and baby blood never mix and then everything travels down through the umbilical cord to baby and then all the waste gets taken out too, right? So mom's doing double duty during uh, pregnancy with getting rid of all of baby's waste as well. So that is what the umbilical cord is for. So when babies are born, obviously you all know that you have to cut the cord, right? So um, I'm curious how many of you guys had partners that cut the cord um, when your baby was born. Um, so yeah, if y'all are just joining me, again, we're talking about newborn care. We're starting with umbilical cord care. Um, so would love to hear if anyone um, had partners who cut the cord uh, for them during their birth. Sometimes people love to do that. Others are like a little squeamish and have no interest. Um, so that is actually a very like kind of squishy tissue. It's actually really difficult to cut. Um, but when babies are first born, obviously they no longer need they're breathing and they're going to be breastfeeding or, um, they're going to be, um, uh, they're going to be breast, they're going to be breastfeeding or bottle feeding, and so they, you know, don't need that umbilical cord. They don't need the placenta anymore. So we cut the cord, right? Um, Cassandra's saying that her husband did it. Very common. Um, if anyone else out there um, had a family member or a husband or a partner cut the cord, love to know. Um, I've had a few dads almost faint while trying to cut the cord, so that's uh, fun, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, so usually that cord is cut. One thing that um, for you guys who are pregnant out there, or maybe if you just had a baby, if you've ever heard of delayed cord clamping, so that's actually delaying when the umbilical cord is cut. Um, it's actually become kind of a common practice, so it's worth asking your doctor to do. Um, at least 30 to 60 seconds is actually recommended, and that's so that all of babies, um, so all of that baby blood that's in the umbilical cord and in the placenta can finish transferring, so it actually helps babies um, with their red blood blood cell count and prevents any anemia and it's actually really great for premature babies. Um, so it's a really great thing to do. Sometimes I've seen midwives actually wait until the cord stops pulsating. Um, so that's another thing you guys can do if, if that's necessary. But obviously if there's any issues, baby has any um, trouble or mom is having any trouble, they might want to cut the cord more quickly. Um, and so that's, but that's something, delayed cord clamping is great. So I'm not sure if anyone had that when they were, um, when their baby was born. And the cool thing about the umbilical cord and the placenta and cutting the cord is that once baby is up, maybe doing skin to skin, right? Another very common practice, that umbilical cord is still pumping blood to baby. So baby doesn't have to be like lower than the placenta in order for that delayed cord clamping to work. So I'm um, curious if anyone out there had that happen um, or had, you know, got to have that experience with their baby with delayed cord clamping. Um, so that's one thing. So then ultimately, like I was saying, the cord gets cut, right? 
And then we have this umbilical cord that's ultimately going to fall off and we're going to get a belly button. Um, so parents need to take care of that umbilical cord. So you'll probably see for the first day or two that it's still kind of um, squishy. And then after a few days, it actually gets black um, and it looks, you know, it gets dried and kind of crunchy um, and black. And it actually takes seven to 14 days, give or take, for that to fall off on its own. Um, so that does happen on its own. And in order to take good care of it, we want to make sure we keep it dry. So one of the things I'm sure you guys will hear about the umbilical cord is to just fold diapers down or um, make sure that they aren't, you know, the umbilical cord isn't within the diaper. A lot of diapers actually come with a little cut, um, like a little kind of semicircle at the top. And that's supposed to help with the, and they're the newborn diapers. That's supposed to help to keep the umbilical cord out of the diaper. Um, unfortunately, most babies are born and they're so little and tiny, even in those newborn diapers, that that little um, half moon doesn't do anything. So you might have to fold it down. You can either fold it inwards or you can fold it outwards. I prefer to do inwards so that that way, um, if you've got any, you know, urine or anything like that, you're not going to get any leaks because you've got that extra layer that's kind of folded in. Sometimes when you fold it out, you've only got that one layer um, extra. So that's one the one little tip that I like to do. Um, but obviously, we want to keep the umbilical cord dry. Um, so we want to keep it out of the diaper. The other thing that we want to be cautious of is not to do a submersion bath yet. So obviously, um, you know, you don't want to put baby in the water. You don't want to put them in their tub like the nice one that you probably got for your shower. You want to keep them outside of that. Um, you want to do a sponge bath. So sponge baths, baths are kind of the same theory, right? You've just got some water elsewhere. You've got baby on a towel and you're washing them from, from head to toe uh, usually and, you know, paying extra attention to the diaper and just being cautious of that area. And then you want to pat that area dry once you're done with your bath. So that keeps it nice and dry um, so that, you you know, it can dry up and it can fall off in those 7 to 14 days. When that umbilical cord falls off, you might see a spot or two of blood that is totally normal. Um, the other thing that's normal is when that umbilical cord, cord falls off, you might see a little bit of like light yellowish or like whitish discharge or clear discharge. That's totally normal. That should um, stop after a little while as well. So within, you know, a couple of hours that should cease. All of that stuff is completely 100% totally normal. To happen when that umbilical cord falls off. Um, I, I've actually had plenty of parents um, call back either the hospital or the pediatrician being super worried. I don't know if anyone out there had that experience when they the umbilical cord fell off and they're like, oh my god, there's a drop of blood. Um, were you that mama who called the, the pediatrician? You are not alone. There are so many moms who do that. Um, so I'm here to tell you that that is all totally normal um, and to not worry at all about that. Um, one of the other things that can, that can happen um, is there's actually sometimes a little bit of extra tissue. Um, I'm, I, I can't remember the name of it right now off the top of my head. Um, an umbilical, I think it's like a granuloma, gram, granuloma. I'm probably mispronouncing that, but it actually, um, if you Google it, it's, it's this like little bit of extra tissue and it kind of looks horrible. It looks like almost like this this red puckering or this like weird um, like skin tag almost and a lot of parents freak out about that it actually can happen it's it's rare but it's it's normal for it to happen and it resolves on its own if a parent's concerned obviously you should talk to your pediatrician and it can be removed there's no nerve endings in that so it doesn't actually cause the baby any harm even during the removal process if that's what you opt to do. So um, yeah, the umbilical gran granuloma, I believe is what it's called, um, is, pr is pretty normal for it to happen. It's rare, but it can happen and it looks a lot worse than it is. With the umbilical cord though, there are a few things that you're gonna wanna watch out for when you, um, you know, as the umbilical cord is healing and as it's drying and falling off. So if at any time there's redness, a significant amount of redness that, you know, let's say you just had a bath, right? And baby's kind of red all over, that's normal. But if it's just the umbilical cord area um, and it's red and it's getting worse, um, if it's hot to the touch, if baby's really irritated, if you accidentally touch that area, those could be signs of an infection. Those are things you'd obviously want to talk to your pediatrician about. If baby has a fever over 100 and 100 point four not 104 104 is really high so you want to call well before that a hundred point four um, you'd want to call the pediatrician and obviously, if you see any, um, what we consider in the industry purulent drainage, um, which is the equivalent of pus. Um, so that's the term I actually used in nursing school. Um, we were taught it because 
purulent drainage is appropriate when written, but um, pus or pussy, um, go ahead and write pussy out um, on a piece of paper, has a very different connotation. So purulent drainage, so if you see any kind of pus that's um, coming out of the, the umbilical cord either before it falls off or af just after it falls off, that can be concerning. So that would be almost like snot or boogers, um, but you're seeing that in the umbilical cord. So you'd want to talk to your pediatrician for that. And if at any time there's a foul smell or there's this really horrible smell coming from um, the baby's umbilical cord, you definitely want to call the doctor because um, umbilical cord infections can be quite serious, um, especially because there's a lot um, on the interior. Obviously, there's a lot of veins and, um, you know, arteries and blood flow. So if you've got an infection, it can actually lead to some very, very serious blood infections and sepsis. So you definitely want to get that taken care of right away. But that's very, very rare. I don't think I've ever seen that in my six years of practice happening um, to a baby in the hospital at all. And I would say, you know, maybe one in a thousand, one in 10,000 kids come back with some kind of issue regarding their umbilical cords. So just keep that in mind. But it's rare, but we want to, um, you know, obviously take that into account. So one of the other things I want to talk about today is circumcisions. I'm curious, this is a very hot topic, so to speak, sometimes. So I'm curious who out there had baby boys. And if you did or didn't get your boys circumcised, um, you know, that can often be a decision, um, either a religious decision or a cultural decision. Sometimes they, you know, families want baby to look like dad or brother. Um, but so circumcisions, you know, there, there can be med medical benefits to it, but there can also be um, some risks. So it's something that you definitely want to talk with your pediatrician and your family and make that kind of educated decision. I am staying out of the debate, y'all. So just putting that right out there. Um, but if you did choose to get your baby circumcised, um, you will want to have some care of the circumcision. So um, when the baby, um, one of the most important things you want to watch out for with a circumcision, which is essentially taking the foreskin off of the tip of the baby's penis, it can, in some cases, they believe it can help with infection, um, with, you know, kind of foreskin infection. However, good hygiene is often usually adequate for that. So, but people who do choose to get their babies circumcised um, do want to make sure that their baby has peed within 24 hours after the circumcision. So that's super, super, super important. Um, and I'm just, um, I just wanted to let you guys know that that's one of the things that either sometimes they can delay you from leaving the hospital if baby hasn't peed right after circumcision um, or within several hours after, or they might want you to check in with them afterwards. So baby peeing is the most important thing, right? So if we've, if we've messed with the plumbing, we want to make sure that the pipe still works. So that's one of the things that's super important with a circumcision. When baby is born, um, oftentimes they will put it with like a petroleum jelly or an antibacterial and they'll put gauze right on top of the, the tip of the penis and then they will cover it with the diaper. So when you go to make that first diaper change, you might see that gauze, you might see that there, you might see a little bit of blood, totally normal. Um, and so I just wanted to let you guys know that you're gonna see that. Some doctors like to replace that dressing, that gauze with the either, like I said, the antibacterial or the um, petroleum jelly. Other doctors don't, they just want you to put a little bit of petroleum jelly on the tip of the penis and cover it with the diaper and that's it, just to care for it. It takes a few days um, for that circumcision area to heal. Um, so I just, you know, wanted to let you know what you'd expect to see. It will be red. It will be raw. You might see a few drops of blood here and there. You should never, ever, ever see more than a quarter size drop of blood on the diaper after circumcision. Even the day of, even like, you know, an hour afterwards, you should never see that. Um, it should always be less than that. Any more than that, and you'd want to let your nurse, your doctor know, because that could be concerning. Um, it could actually be it's good that you catch it but it could actually be a sign that baby has some blood clotting issues so um, I just wanted to get that out there. So, and I wanted to thank everyone for tuning in. Um, I see that um, Cassandra has a question. I will get to that in a second. Um, and if anyone else is out there tuning in and you're finding this content interesting or, or you think you've got friends out there who are, you know, who are pregnant or just had a baby, have them tune in. Um, go ahead and share or tag them here. We'd love to have them listen. We're talking again about newborn care, about umbilical cord care. We just finished. We're just in the middle of circumstances care um, and we're going to be moving on to when to call the doctor um, and things and as well as jaundice so um, and I just wanted to address because I think Cassandra had a little question here about circumcision so um, 
that she had her son circumcised just after birth um, is one or the other more common. Um, it's actually equally common these days. I would say in the past um, with circumcisions, it was pretty common for people to always get their child circumcised. Certain religions, Jewish religion, Muslim religion, it's actually required. Um, they don't often even do it in the hospital. It's done separately after um, outside of the hospital by their religious authority, by their rabbi, um, and they do it in the home. So it's a whole separate religious ceremony. But these days where um, the evidence for it being a medic medically beneficial procedure is minimal. Um, I would say there's a lot more people kind of going 50-50, um, but certainly it depends on the culture and the religion. So um, I'm, maybe it's like 80-20, 70-30 at this point, but pr prior it was a lot more common for people to get their babies circumcised, in my opinion, based on what I saw in the hospital. So um, as the years have been progressing, I see less and less kids getting circumcised. Um, so again, with circumcision care, um, we want to make sure that that area stays clean. We want to make sure that we wash, and this can be a little bit painful, so we want to have hot soapy water, and we might have to wash the tip of the penis um, with that hot soapy water to get off any poo, because obviously babies, they're just messy, and they're diapers, and they're moving around, and all that jazz, so um, we want to make sure we keep that area clean. Um, again, I mentioned the doctor may or may not want you to replace um, the gauze on top with the petroleum jelly as a kind of a dressing for the first day or two for that. Um, in other cases, they don't. They just want to make sure that the diaper um, is not sticking to the wound in any way. If you ever have to remove move gauze or let's say the di diaper is stuck to the, circ um, the circumcision area, you would want to wet it with some warm water and just be really gentle as you're pulling that off because that can be su you know super painful, just like if a Band-Aid gets stuck to a cut, um, but obviously in a very sensitive area. So um, just be cautious with that. One of the other things that can be recommended is to keep the diaper loosely fastened so that it's not causing any undue pressure. In some cases, I actually like to do the opposite for the first day so that you're actually providing a little bit of pressure to the wound um, so that it's causing it's helping, you know, with the blood flow clamp down and things like that. So that actually might even be for the first hour or two, um, but it's not something that you need to um, continue to do. And obviously you want to make sure that you've put that petroleum jelly or the anti back on top of the, the tip of the penis so that it heals nicely. Um, one of the other things that's actually a pro tip, which I love to do, um, is two diapers. So you can put the first diaper, again, you've got the petroleum jelly, maybe the gauze, if that's what the doctor's recommended, you put the first diaper on, then you can actually put a little Little bit of ice between the two diapers so now you've got that as pain relief for baby too and because you're loosely fastening the diaper you've got that second diaper that you can kind of clamp down on a little bit more and that's going to prevent any leakages or spills if you've got a baby who's you know a big peer and you've got urine everywhere you don't want that to happen so that's a really cool pro tip that I love to advise parents to do. I'm curious if you've ever heard that before, um, if that is something that maybe you'll try with your next baby. Um, so that's, you know, that's a, that's a tip that um, I've seen people use and I love it. It's just a great, great idea. Um, it also can help because sometimes you see babies squirming and moving, their legs can kind of hit their penis and that really hurts if they have a cirque. So that double padding of the diapers can be super helpful. Um, in, in some cases, you can also use Tylenol to help baby with their pain because babies can be kind of fussy after the circumcision procedure. Um, and one of the other things, obviously, we've talked about this a million times, so I'll spare you, um, is to use your five S's to soothe baby after. That can also be after vac vaccinations, right? So if baby's ever fussy after circumcisions or vaccinations, your five S's can be super helpful. So that's your swaddling, your swaying, your shushing, your sucking on a pacifier, um, as as well as side or stomach lying and that last one again is only when baby is awake or you are like in contact with baby baby is fully attended to um, as opposed to you're leaving them alone in the crib for a nap right so never um, always on their back to sleep but so utilize those for pain relief and often like I said sometimes doctors will prescribe a little bit of baby Tylenol can be super helpful um, if there's any pain residual pain but it's a usually a pretty painless procedure um, babies are usually only a little fussy for that day after if at all some little boys are like meh whatever um, and others are just little fuss buckets for a day or so um, so keep that in mind and during the procedure we're, we're giving them um, some pain medication not Tylenol but this thing called uh, Sweeties which is a sugar water um, you'd never want to mix your own sugar water um, it is actually comes it's it comes in the med the uh, medication machine so we have to get it out and scan it just like a Tylenol um, but it is something that we're giving babies for pain relief and often of course lidocaine too right when we're doing that circumcision so um, it is it is a painful procedure but we obviously do as much as we can to mitigate it and it's way I've heard I've heard 
the um, you know the excuse of like it's way better to have that kind of pain as a newborn when you won't remember it as opposed to you know maybe not circumcising and coming down with infections and then your four-year-old boy has to go to get a circumcision so obviously again you know just proper care uh, even with an uncircumcised penis can be um, sufficient but you know just make sure you're making the right decision for your family and talk to your doctor and read all that literature out there again staying out of that debate folks so um, one of the things with circumcision you're going to want to watch out for, it's totally normal, I said, for it to be red, raw. Um, you might see a few little drops of blood, never more than a quarter. You'd want to call the doctor if you saw that. You also might see little white dots on the tip of the penis on day two or three, and that's actually what's called granulated tissue. So that's like the skin healing. So that is normal for you to see those like white um, little flecks. Totally normal for that to happen, and it'll actually get um, kind of better looking after that. So um, don't panic if you see it that way. Swelling is also normal for the first day after a circumcision, but if it's day two, three, four, and you're seeing swelling or the swelling went down and now it's going back up, that would be a concerning point you'd want to talk to your doctor about. Um, if you ever have that yellow discharge, um, yellow discharge or that clear discharge I mentioned with the umbilical cord can also happen with the circumcision, but if you see it for more than a week, that would be concerning. If it's again, purulent drainage or pus um, or any kind of, like I said, that's almost like boogers, but you're having that around your penis, that would be concerning. Any foul smells, any fever over 100.4. Um, yeah, any persistent redness after those, you know, four, five, six days, um, things like that. And if it's ever crusty or it has fluid filled sores, I would imagine most parents would see that and panic and call their doctor. You're right to do that. So um, go ahead. I mean, certainly all of this is treatable, but those are things that are not normal. Um, and then again, difficulty urinating. That's probably one of the most important things that parents should watch out for is that their baby can pee within 24 hours after having a circumcision. So um, I'm curious um, if anyone out there um, found what I said valuable with the circumcision. Again, if anyone out there um, got a circumcision for their baby, had any kind of complications, um, they you know can be rare, but certainly it's something to watch out for. So it's some, sometimes interesting to see if any of our viewers have had those experiences. So again, thank you all for tuning in. Um, I'd love to know where you're tuning in from, how old your baby is. Um, if you have any newborn care questions, I would love to hear them. Please add them. I will get to a Q&A right at the end. So if I, if I see it pop up, I'm not going to answer right away. Um, I will wait till the end. So don't panic there. But um, thank you all for tuning in. And don't forget to tag friends um, if you found any of the information I provided to be helpful. Um, because if it's helpful for you, it's probably helpful for some other mamas out there. So even if you're tuning in after, if it's not live anymore, you're just watching the broadcast later, and you found it valuable, tag your friends um, and tell us where you're tuning in from. I'd love to hear from you guys. Um, the other topic I wanted to cover today, and this is a big one, so jaundice. So jaundice is um, a term you may or may not have heard if you're pregnant, if you've had a baby, I'm sure you've heard it um, because jaundice is quite common. So I want to explain a little bit about how jaundice happens. So 60% of babies get jaundice or 60% or more of babies get jaundice. So that's a lot. Um, it's a very common thing. So jaundice is actually a buildup of bilirubin and bilirubin is produced by the liver when red blood cells, like we all have red blood cells, right? That's our blood and they're the blood cells and they provide oxygen to our limbs and things like that. And they float around in our bloodstream and that's great. But after a while they die, right? We have to get new ones made all the time and our body is doing that. But when they die, they get processed by the liver or when they've kind of reached their, their end of shelf life, so to speak. Um, so they're processed by the liver and that is bilirubin. You've all seen bilirubin. If anyone out there has poop that is brown, that is thanks to bilirubin. So y'all know that. Um, I'm sure you've all seen it. Um, so bilirubin is, like I said, produced by the liver. I'm sure you've all seen baby's first poop, meconium. That is that black, tarry, really, really thick, um, like sticky poo. And that is because of a buildup of excessive bilirubin, or not bilirubin, but that's the process, that is all that bilirubin just in there because babies aren't pooping in the womb, right? They've got to hold that all in. So all those blood cells for the first nine to 10 months that they've been utilizing, if they've, like I said, passed their shelf life and they need to be processed, they are getting processed and then they're getting moved moved into the, into the bowels and they're staying there for nine months. So it's getting nice and concentrated. So instead of brown, it's this dark, 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 tarry black. And so because of that buildup, that's where, so in the first few days of life, yes, baby's eating, 
but it's taking them a day or two, sometimes two and a half, three days to pass all of that meconium poop. And then they're getting some of the, you know, mom's breast milk might not be in, um, things like that. So it takes a little while for that digestive tract to actually get flowing where they're taking things in and putting things out. Um, and so because of that, there can be a buildup of red, like dead red blood cells or um, that bilirubin. And that's what causes the jaundice. So it's super, super common um, for babies. And I'm not sure if any of you knew the science behind it, but how to learn that in nursing school and I found a lot of um, patients really found that interesting and, and useful to know how that worked um, so that they knew how common it was so just would love to hear back from other folks too if that was helpful for you if you knew that before if you're a big bio you know maybe you're a biology major in college um, so you knew all that but um, again, it's not, it's, it's a very interesting process. Babies always have, um, they have a lot of very interesting anatomy actually. Um, so, um, I'm happy to be able to share some of my knowledge. So jaundice, like I said, totally common, over 60% of babies have it or come down with it. It usually resolves itself naturally within two to three weeks. It's actually the most common for babies who had bruises at birth. Um, so if your baby, you know, in any way, sometimes when they're trying to come down the birth canal, they're bumping their head up against your pelvis or, you know, they're, they're just doing silly things in the womb. And so sometimes they might come out with a little bit of a bruise or a bump. Um, depending on how big that is, it, that is obviously if you've got a bruise, so another anatomy piece, if y'all have a bruise, that is actually um, your blood has kind of leaked into You've broken a blood vessel and it's leaked into the tissue and it and those are dead red blood cells that then need to be processed. So if you've got a big bruise or baby has any kind of um, bruising or um, like I said, they've been bumping up against bones and in, inside the womb as they're trying to come through that birth canal, um, it can actually have a higher instance of jaundice. Um, Technically, I was mentioning the, the delayed cord clamping earlier. Some babies um, with that delayed cord clamping can be really beneficial long term, but might actually lead to higher instances of jaundice. Um, so that's another thing that can happen if they had a, a brother or sister who had jaundice, it's more common for your next baby to have jaundice. So um, if anyone out there, I would love to know if anyone out there had if their baby had jaundice when they were born. Um, it can also actually be really, really common in babies of East Asian descent. Um, I worked in a hospital in downtown Boston that was in Chinatown. So there were a lot of Chinese, Vietnamese, um, you know, uh, Japanese, there were all sorts of babies um, of Asian descent um, at that hospital. And it was actually very common um, for those babies to, to get it. And it can be slightly more common for babies of breastfed mothers. That's only because it sometimes takes mom's um, breast milk a little bit more time to come in as opposed to getting kind of larger volumes of milk um, from a bottle right away. Neither is good nor bad. I'm just giving the facts here. Um, so those are things just to keep in mind if your baby had jaundice, maybe that's why um, some of those things. Um, it can actually be more noticeable in fair skinned or light babies. So I've got the red hair, some fair skin. Um, I was probably, I probably looked more jaundice than let's say an African American um, or a baby of Indian descent or, you know, um, Middle Eastern descent might look. Um, but it's definitely doesn't necessarily mean that they have issues with the jaundice. They just might look worse. Um, so it's not necessarily more common in that particular case. Um, it's easily treated um, and it's checked at the hospital several times as well as at the first few pediatrician appointments depending on if there's issues. So initially it can be checked with this little like light probe that's placed on the forehead and it just like bounces the light through the skin, hits the bone, bounces back and it reads the amount of um, you know jaundice or bilirubin in the blood and then if that level's high or you know awkward for some reason they might draw some blood and that's usually done by a heel stick. So super easy and common to treat um, or to, to check out and so you'll you'll notice that when baby's born as well visually the jaundice will move from head to toe so that's really interesting so when baby first gets jaundice you'll start to see it in their face first then it'll move down their neck to their chest maybe to their arms their legs then, then you know maybe they're gonna look like bright orange um, in some cases um, so obviously the the more that it's progressing down the body it's kind of the worst that it's getting in a way visually. Again, visually isn't always the best um, tool to, to measure the exact levels of jaundice, but just letting you know that you will likely see the jaundice and you'll see it kind of getting worse before it gets better. That's very normal. Um, again, it gets a little bit worse before it gets better because mom's breast milk is taking a little bit of time to get in. Um, so that's 
usually um, something to note. If your baby's jaundice was getting better and somehow it's starting to get worse um, or it's getting much worse, like significantly worse overnight, you'd want to call your pediatrician if you're home um, and check in with them. Um, to help prevent or in some cases treat jaundice, the biggest thing is get baby eating and pooping, eating and pooping, eating and pooping. So breastfeed often, eight to 12 times a day. I know that's a ton. Um, you wanna make sure baby stays awake during the feeding. So you're gonna maybe like a cool cloth, gonna wanna brush their cheek. Really, if they fall asleep while they're feeding, keep them feeding and eight to 12 times a day. If you're bottle feeding, there's usually less of a concern with that. You don't need to like force them to eat a ton. They usually get plenty through a bottle it's just a different process right because it takes a little while for that breast milk to come in um but that you know that you if they're still falling asleep during a bottle you want to make sure that they're awake during that because that's going to limit their intake as well um and then phototherapy we call it baby sun tanning at work um so sometimes it's just a, a like a literally if you go sun tanning it's like those those beds um but we'll have a light that shines over baby and they have to be naked or just in a diaper um and then sometimes we have this thing called a blanket that they lay on top of so um, i'm curious if anyone out there had a baby with high jaundice um and if you got to see those phototherapy lights uh, the little baby sun tanning bed oh and of course, for baby's eyes, we actually have these little um, baby sunglass type things that's actually um, almost like a neoprene like set of goggles that we put on them. It's kind of adorable. Um, so would love if anyone out there had a baby like that, uh, what you thought of that particular process. Because like I said, loved those um, little baby goggles. I think that was my favorite part. And oftentimes um, when babies are really jaundiced, so this is why I'm saying make sure baby stays awake during their feedings. Jaundice can actually lead to lethargy or lead to them being kind of sluggish and sleepy, um, especially if babies are really difficult to wake up or stay awake during feedings. And this is a continual problem as their jaundice is getting worse. You'd want to check in with your doctor because because um, extreme lethargy or like I said sluggishness or excessive sleepiness where you can't even really wake them up to feed is a sign that you'd want to call your doctor about their jaundice or uh, concerns about it right um, and it's really really important to make sure John stays in check because if there's too much bilirubin in the bloodstream and we're talking extreme amounts but certainly again important to keep in touch it can actually cause um cernicterus which is a very fancy term for some brain damage and some issues there so and deafness and things like that so really important if you've got a super super sleepy baby um, especially if they're all of a sudden like bright orange their whole body like I said it moves head to toe and they're super sleepy they're no longer waking up for feeds you'd want to call your pediatrician right away for that um, so those are things to be careful of when it comes to jaundice Lastly on this, and I want to kind of um, try to keep this, I know we've already gone like about 30 minutes, so I want to get to your questions, is when to call the doctor. And we've talked about this a bit already. So the most important things with a newborn when to call the doctor are any signs of infection. So baby's got a fever over 100.4, any signs of umbilical cord infection, redness, inflame inflammation they've got pus or purulent drainage surrounding it foul smell baby's really irritated when you're touching that area any of those things um, are all signs of an infection again we talked about circumcision infections or circumcision care um, and infections there so same thing persistent redness yellow discharge more than a week um, swelling beyond day one or um, specifically if you've got those crusty fluid filled sores um, that would be no good and you'd want to um, talk to your pediatrician Another really big um, thing that's considered an infection, um, it's actually super common, is thrush. And I actually had a, um, a friend of mine, I happened to just go visit her. She had had a baby, I want to say like a month prior, and I hadn't seen her in a while, so I just want, I was in the area, I wanted to pop in and see her. And, you know, she invited me in, but she was breastfeeding, and she had these really horrible sores all around her nipples. And she was like, they're so painful, and they're bleeding, and I'm worried, and, you know, things like that. And I took one look at that baby's mouth, it had this white kind of film on the tongue as well as on the insides of the cheeks um, was very clearly what's considered thrush so it's just um, uh, I'm trying to think it's it's um my brain is t totally escaping me on what a yeast I'm sorry so it's a yeast built up um, so kind of like women get yeast infections but instead um, it's obviously not related to that in any way very different type of yeast but it's a yeast and it can be passed very easily from baby to mom baby to mom baby to mom so if mom's got it then baby will get it or if baby gets it then that's why that mom's nipples were very cracked red sore um, so I'm curious if any of you out there have ever dealt with thrush it's another thing like I said if you've got a baby if you've got sore cracked nipples um, and that are like like, 
you've got it's like almost like a rash is what it seems like to mom or if you especially if you see baby with white film on their tongue or on the insides of their mouths that can be a sign of thrush um, it's not deadly in any way um, but certainly it's super painful for mom and it can be a pain in the butt to get rid of so it's something you want to call the doctor about so any breastfeeding mamas out there um, would definitely want to call the doctor about that um, one of the other things we want to check for with baby is diapers and how many diapers they're having. So when baby is first born, they should have one wet diaper. By day two, they have two wet diapers. By day three, they have three wet diapers. By day four, four. By day five into six, seven, etc., they should have five to six wet diapers a day. For those, I'm sure all of you know, there's a little yellow line that's right in the center of the diaper from the outside. It turns blue when it comes into contact with water. So you can tell if baby's had a wet diaper just by like you don't even have to change the diaper you can just look at that blue line so that's a great indicator so babies like I said should have one pee for the first day two by day two three by day three four by day four five and more anytime after day five so that's important. Um, if baby, some babies will get a little bit dehydrated as they're waiting for mom's uh, breast milk to come in, and that's totally normal. You might see if um, some uric acid crystals, which almost appear to be blood, they might be these yellow um, or reddish spots on the diaper. That's normal. But if it persists for more than a day, if your milk is very clearly in, if you know they were having five wet diapers and now they have one, um, these can all be signs of dehydration. So you'd want to talk to your doctor about that. Um, one of the other things from a diaper perspective, obviously we talked about meconium, baby's first poop. And then for um, once that kind of clears day two, day three, if you're breastfeeding, you're likely going to see this like um, yellowish or like it's almost like cream colored with these little seeds. It looks like little seeds and that that's very common. And babies often have multiple, almost every time you feed them, if they're a breastfed baby, they'll have a, a poopy diaper that looks like that. And that's all totally normal. Obviously from black tarry to the breastfeeding stools, you're going to see some kind of transitions um, into that. It's not just going to go from like black and tarry right into the breastfeeding stools, but it's going to kind of transition. So it'll be less sticky. Um, less black it'll be more brown and then it'll transition to that tan or cream color with seeds um, and then bottle fed babies often have kind of a similar they might have more um, you know more of a like a, a darker tan or brown color stool um, is very common for that so those are things to, to keep in mind and that's all normal and oftentimes breastfed babies their poo is very watery anyway um, and it seems watery but if there's absolutely no solid parts at all to more than one poopy diaper and we're talking it looks like you took brown water or tan water and just poured it into the diaper that can be a sign of diarrhea so one diarrhea is not a problem but multiple can can easily lead to de dehydration and you'd want to talk to your doctor about that so um, keep that in mind the other big thing which is super 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 rare but I want to let you know if anyone adult baby toddler anyone has colorless white chalky poop not normal you should talk to a doctor immediately that can be very concerning so white chalky poop very different than the tan or cream colored that has seeds in it um, but yeah, you'd want to talk to a doctor about it and think about it. When you've got a new baby, you're going to go home from the hospital. You're going to kind of, kind of gotten to know that baby for the first few days, whatever they are like by that day that you go home, maybe it's day two. If you had a vaginal delivery, maybe it's day four with a C-section, then you're, then you, that's the new baseline. So you're going home too with different things happening to you. That's your new baseline. You just want to keep that in mind. And if anything significant changes, usually for the worse in a way, right? Um, you'd want to talk to your pediatrician or just touch in. The pediatrician's offices are very used to mo new moms calling, super common. You're just joining the mom club, right? Um, any moms, any moms out there want to, you know, back me up on this? That once you have a kid, I think calling the pediatrician maybe once a week, uh, at least once a month, or a trip to the pediatrician is like just that's like you've got your mom card now, right? Right, everyone um, would love to hear you guys back me up on that one so um, no worries there for for mama so always just touch in with your pediatrician if you're worried or concerned um, and again we talked about the jaundice if baby is ever super lethargic or difficult to wake um, and they're kind of that all of a sudden their jaundice they were just a little bit yellow they've got maybe yellow eyes that can be a, a, a very um, a high sign of jaundice that's kind of the last place that you might see jaundice is in the whites of the eyes um, so if you notice that your baby's super jaundice and they're having difficulty waking up you definitely want to call your pediatrician 
So that is all the content that I've got for y'all today. Um, I appreciate everyone tuning in. I would love to hear if there are any questions. Like I said, we talked about umbilical care cord, uh, umbilical cord care today. We talked about circumcision care. We talked about jaundice, um, and we also talked about when to call the doctor. Um, curious if you have any, you know, any residual questions out there, things I didn't talk about. If you tuned in late, maybe you didn't get a chance to see um, some of the earlier information. I'm happy to answer any questions. Maybe it's not even on those topics. Maybe it's just like completely unrelated. You want to know if you should get a Christmas tree um, with colored lights or white lights. Like, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm happy to to um, to tune in uh, to answer any of your questions for those who've tuned in and have questions. So um, yeah. And while we're waiting for some kind of the questions to roll in, um, cause sometimes it can be a minute while y'all are typing. Um, I wanted to remind you that if any of the content I shared today was helpful for you or things that, you know, um, res uh, you know, sat with you well and, and were really helpful for you and you um, wish you had known that when you were having your, your baby or if you're pregnant and you didn't know that information or you have a new baby and any of the information I shared was helpful, um, I would love for you to share this video or tag a friend so that they can watch it because like I said, if it was helpful for you, it's probably helpful for, for some other mamas out there and I love to know who's watching. So um, for example, like Cassandra, um, I would love to know how old your baby is and where you're tuning in from because um, some people attend every week and so I love to get to kind of know get to know you guys um, so I'm Melissa I'm a maternity nurse I'm the owner and founder of Tranquilo um, and I have six years of experience in maternity so that's me and I live in Boston um, I actually live in a tiny house too so if anyone wants to know about that um, like the kind you see on HGTV so that's where I'm tuning in from um, if anyone um, wants to you know would love to share and get to know you all that way too um, so curious if there are any other questions. One of the other things, oh, got a ton of questions that just popped in here now that I've been talking. Um, somebody said that aquifer baby ointment works great. Um, and there are baby nurses as well. That can be really, really helpful as well for the cert, um, for the cert care. So yes, thank you, Shirley, for, um, for mentioning that as well. Always love to have other nurses chime in because things that were common at my hospital might be very different, um, from, from other folks. Um, let's see, we got a mom... 10 month old um, partner is firm in wanting to have my son circumcised. Um, I wish I had understood more of the details, pros and cons. So yeah, it's a really important decision to make, um, Alexandra. So glad you brought that up if any mom's out there. Let's see, we've got Rochester, Minnesota, four kiddos, last is four months. Oh, that's awesome, Cassandra. Um, do you have boys, girls? Um, you can always PM me too if you don't wanna share publicly on Facebook, um, but that's great. We actually have a few of our team members who live in Rochester, New York, um, which is a good segue. Um, next week we are doing a mom's favorite items um, and it's a giveaway there's gonna be five chances for y'all to win so it's like our favorite baby sleep products um, and we're gonna have two of my colleagues Melissa and Ashley um, who are in Rochester New York not Minnesota um, but kind of a you know a little a synergy there um, they're gonna be demoing and showing and talking about our favorite products so be sure to tune in for that let's see um, uh, we got a few people tagging folks, much appreciated. Um, does our company do uh, military discounts? We don't, but we do have some um, some discount codes, especially if you join our uh, mailing list. Um, it's something that um, you should definitely do and just keep an eye out. And we always do giveaways too. Um, so if you need, um, and Larissa, if you need to, you can always contact our customer service and, and you know, we try to help families out as best we can. So um, coupons can vary from percentages as well. So especially if you're on our mailing list, you'll find out about it. It, um, but it's kind of private in that way so you have to join the join the club so to speak um, we don't like to just spam random people so um, let's see um, Kristen had a question about donating cord blood is that something that you should consider um, so that's actually another great hot topic um, we're talking about circumcisions we're talking about uh, cord um, uh, umbilical cord banking blood banking um, so that it depends there's two types of ways to bank baby's cord blood privately which is where you often pay several thousand dollars um, to, to kind of get that um, cord blood retrieved and then kind of banked and then you're paying like a, a fee every year upwards of three hundred dollars a year to kind of keep that cord blood so it can be like a three to five thousand dollar investment um, to be able to do that the chances of your baby actually needing um, their own cord blood is super rare I think it's like less than one percent less than half a percent um, of your baby or anyone in the family needing that particular 
um, cord blood, but the cord blood, it can be, it's actually baby's, baby's blood and specifically the cord blood, if it's, cause that umbilical cord gets kind of thrown away and there might be blood in it. So if it's banked, there's a lot of um, stem cells, which again, another hot topic, not going to go there, but can be really helpful in medical research. So um, privately banking, it can be good only, uh, usually only or worth it, so to speak, if you've got a family member already who has a, a medical uh, disorder that can easily be treated with stem cells. So they'd have to be a match with baby. That might be a case where you'd want to privately bank, um, but public banking is a really great option. It's free to donate and it can actually 60, I think it was like 65 to 90% of, or 95% of people who have treatable diseases with um, baby stem cells can actually get, find a, find somebody they, they, they match well in a public bank and get the treatment that they need. So, you know, think about it as a way, like you just brought life into this world and you know, you're helping another life who might be sick. That's kind of a great way. So I like to really um, push if you're going to do it the public banks um, and then it's you know if you if your babies um, help somebody else and then maybe your family needs it it'll, you'll feel good about that right um, but the public ones it's again it's it's really kind of limited circumstances and you'd want to kind of know the pros and the cons if sure if you can afford three to five thousand dollars and you want that kind of safety net go for it but you know that's expensive and babies already cost like you know parents spend thousands of dollars before baby comes and then during their first year so um, just know your pros and cons there um, but I would I would seriously consider publicly banking um, again if you don't have any religious um, things against kind of medical research or, or diseases that can be cured with stem cells um, and again this is not stem cells collected in, in other ways it's from umbilical cord blood that's already going to be thrown away um, if, if nothing else is done with it so um, let's see Lisa didn't have any questions um, but she does have twins and one of them throws up d daily I don't know what to do so there's a difference between spitting up and throwing up um, so I just want to be clear about that and Lisa I would love for you to kind of chime in because I don't know your situation um, but all babies spit up and so spit up can be probably like a teaspoon maybe even a tablespoon depending on how old baby is if you've got a one month old two month old their feeds might be four six eight ounces right so if they're spitting up just an ounce of that that's totally normal and that can be all at once kind of like right after the feed let's say they have a burp and they're like Bleh, and then they kind of throw up if they're throwing up half or all of their entire feed at least once a day I would talk to your doctor they might have um, there's actually Actually, so you've got your esophagus, right? So you've got your mouth and you're swallowing there's actually that swallow is there's like a little um, I call it like a doggy door a, a gasket however you want to put it um, I'm forgetting the medical term right now off the top of my head um, but that's when you swallow that's opening that so that's opening your esophagus right so that's opening so things can go down into your tummy you have another one at the at the stomach so there's another kind of doggy door like a um, the name again the name's gonna like pop I'm gonna turn turn off this live and I'm gonna remember the name of that particular surely if you want to chime in here my brain is I'm not thinking of um, sphincter that's what it's called so we all know what other sphincters are so there's a sphincter at the top when you swallow that's opening and closing the esophagus and the windpipe and then you've got another one down by your stomach and so babies who have acid reflux issues that sphincter when babies are born isn't very um, it's not muscular enough yet and so oftentimes they can have kind of like acid reflux they can have their feeds kind of come up um, and it's more common for those kiddos to throw up um, and that would be like I said a significant portion so Lisa just to be clear you might want to talk to your pediatrician about the differences um, you know and kind of monitor that so a little bit is spitting up totally normal totally fine it might seem like a lot but it's just an ounce but if it's like the entire feeding, like projectile vomit style, like that's probably something that you should talk to your doctor about because it might be an acid reflux issue. Um, let's see, does umbilical cord care determine if a baby has an innie or an outie? Lorna, no, unfortunately, that is just genetics. It's just how it flies. There's absolutely nothing that you can or can't do um, to prevent an outie or to get an innie, unfortunately. So great question. I probably got that like once a day um, in the hospital. So very common, but unfortunately, no, there's nothing else that you can do. Um, let's see. Um, Maria said, what if I already gave my baby a submerged bath? Is that okay? Yes, of course. You just want to make sure that baby is, you've got that umbilical cord dried. You want to make sure that they're, um, you know, don't put them in kind of tight fitting clothing, clothing right away. Kind of maybe let them air dry a little bit more for that, you know, few hours after that submerged bath. They're going to be fine. It's not like, you know, this is, 
the end of the world here at all, but just don't do any future submerged baths, okay? Um, and just make sure you're allowed to doing everything you can in the future to kind of keep that nice and dried out. So no panic, Maria, you're totally fine. Um, and then Christian, um, can't decide what to do if I should get my baby size, circumcised or not. Um, yeah, I, as I mentioned, I'm not going to get into that debate. Um, certainly there are what are seen as some possible medical, um, you know, assistance with decreased infections and things like that. Um, the studies are a little bit weak in that regard. Um, and certainly it's often more of a religious or a cultural thing. So, you know, maybe you're circumcised um, or your, your, the, the, your other baby is or your brother or your dad like whatever it's more like a family thing or religiously like I said it's definitely usually required um, for for uh, Judaism as well as Muslim faith is very common um, so you know if you're gonna do it for that reason that's the reason to do it but from a, it's not like a medical necessity that it needs to be done and there are risks so it's something that you're gonna want to um, kind of research on your own talk about and I'm also certainly happy to have a conversation um, privately more you know we can talk a little bit more about your situation um, and kind of answer those questions but I don't want to give you advice on like what I would do um, because that really doesn't matter that's your choice um, and like I said it's a hot button issue and you know I don't want to I don't want to weigh down and be like well Melissa thinks exactly this and so everyone else who does it is completely wrong first off that's not my my policy in any way um, Every, everyone has the right to kind of live their life as they so choose. Um, and so we all make different choices. We all just want to be happy, right? We want what's best for ourselves and our family. So, um, you know, you're going to have to kind of make that decision yourself. So, um, unless I don't see any other questions, I'll give it an, um, Oh, Oh, I apparently have a delayed feed here. I apologize about that. All right. Um, yeah. Okay. So if there are any other questions out there, um, I'll wait a minute or two. There weren't any, we got people tagging people. Thank you, Sheila, for tagging a friend. Um, Maria's thanking me for um, answering her question. Appreciate that. I appreciate all of you all for tuning in. Um, like I said, if you're tuning in um, after the fact, if you're watching after the live broadcast and any of the information I've shared is helpful, would love for you to tag a friend um, or, you know, share this with them. And as well, I'd love to get to know y'all. So I love to know where you're tuning in from. Um, like I said, Sheila, I believe is a, a baby nurse as well. So good to meet you. Love to have, see colleagues on here as well. Um, but love to get to know our, um, our following and, and that kind of thing. So, um, all right. It looks like I've got another question that came in. Um, but I, it's not showing up on this feed. It's it seems like it's private and I don't, I don't know how to get it like came as a pop-up and now I don't know how to get out of this to check that cause I couldn't read it fast enough. Um, so all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna wait another minute or two. If for whatever reason I don't um, see that come in, I'll answer that person privately, and you know maybe I'll I'll, I'll mention it in our in the next time I'm um, on the feed as well. So if it's a common question for other folks as well, so. Um, much appreciate y'all again for tuning in next week. Definitely tune in every Thursday, noon Eastern Standard Time. Um, we do a live. It's sometimes me, the nurse. It's sometimes other experts in other fields. We've had some... Um, sleep consultants on. We're going to have um, some moms on in the future. Um, we've had some doulas on, things like that. So we always have um, inf interesting information. And next week, you don't want to miss it. I know I'm super excited because two of my colleagues, moms, Melissa and Ashley, are going to be doing their favorite baby sleep products. Um, and they're going to be demoing, showing, talking about them. And we're also going to be doing a giveaway. So there's going to be um, five chances for you guys to win the products that we have um, that we're going to be demoing and showing. So you don't want to miss it. Um, and again, I appreciate y'all for tuning in. Thanks again, guys. And I will see you in two weeks, um, just after the new year. So have a happy holidays. It's, I believe it's Hanukkah right now. Have a Merry Christmas, um, Kwanzaa, whatever it is that you celebrate and a happy new year. And I personally will see you all next year, but don't forget to tune in next week, um, for our lives. So thanks y'all. Bye.